Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. Would you stand with us? Today we celebrate the 10-year anniversary of 9-11. We want to invite you guys personally to sing something to the old country hymns with us this morning. We sing my country to the beat.
awfully good to sing those songs on this very special day when 10 years after the events of 9-11, we come together to remember and to honor those who lost their lives and to those who are still paying the ultimate sacrifice every single day. It is good to welcome you. I'm lead pastor Brian Loveless, and let's start it off this way before we go too much further. Let's start with a pledge, a pledge to our American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, we've been anticipating today for a long, long time, and we are awfully excited that you're here with us. We've seen a lot of our church family here at Calvary Baptist and a bunch of first-time guests and visitors along with some very special guests that we want to introduce here in just a moment. Uh, every guest today is a special guest, however. We're going to ask you to do this. If this is your first time with us here at Calvary, you received a little bulletin, hopefully, when you came in. There's a tear-out section inside. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, and if you're a first or second time visitor here at Calvary, just check the little appropriate box and turn it in at the offering in a few moments or at the Welcome Center when this service is concluded. And uh, we promise not to show up on your doorstep or stalk you or anything else, uh, but we'd love to have a record of your attendance and we'll send you a little Starbucks card just to thank you for filling that out. This morning, among our very, very special guests, um, we have our new police chief here in Grand Prairie, uh, Chief Steve Dye and his wife Mimi. Chief, would you raise your hand back there so we can give you a hand? Let's give them a hand. Pleasure to have you. And if you're here this morning and you are presently a law enforcement officer, or you have served our nation in that capacity, let me say first of all how very grateful we are for the price you pay every day for what you do to keep our streets safe and what you do in this community. If you have served as a law enforcement officer or are presently serving as a law enforcement officer, would you stand to your feet so we can honor you this morning? We also have another very, very special uh, couple here today. We have our fire chief here in Grand Prairie, Mr. Cliff Nelson, and his wife Lisa are here. Would you stand, chief, and let us give you a hand, you and your family. We are extremely, extremely grateful in a community sense for what our firefighters do every single day protecting our community. And let me say we are extremely grateful in a personal sense because it wasn't too long ago that I got the call from Russell Brundrett and he said, Preacher, there's smoke pouring out of our chapel, the building's on fire. Actually, what he said is the church is on fire. And I said, which church, man, which church? <laughs> and he told me which building and, and they responded so rapidly and uh, save the building and our library and our books, and we're very grateful. Yeah. If you are presently a firefighter or have served in that capacity at some point in the past, would you please stand to your feet so we can honor you this morning? It has been my pleasure over the past few months in particular to come in contact with a lot of our soldiers, a lot of young men that are coming back from Afghanistan, coming back from Iraq, uh, that in this ongoing war on terror have been willing to leave family and country behind to go and defend us in foreign lands. They have done a fantastic job for us and for our country. We are eternally grateful. And if you're here this morning and you are presently serving in our armed forces, or you have served in some branch of the armed forces community in the past, would you please stand to your feet at this moment so we can honor you. <laughs> well, 
God bless you. We're so happy you're here. We have a big day planned. We pray that it gives honor above and beyond everything to our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that today is a great day of honoring and remembrance. Let's stand to our feet, all of us, one last time. Let's get around for the next few moments. Shake somebody's hand. Tell, some, tell somebody you're glad to have them on this special day. Did you burst out and cry for the red, white, and blue? The 
heroes who die just doing what they do. Could you look up to heaven for some kind of answer? And look at yourself, what really matters? I'm just a singer of simple songs. I'm not a real political man. I watch CNN, but I'm not sure I can tell you the difference in our rock and our but I know Jesus and I talk to God And I remember this from when I was young Faith, hope, and love are some good things He gave us The greatest is love Where were you when the world stopped turning On that September day I'm teaching a class full of innocence children driving down some cold interstate did you feel guilty because you're a survivor in a crowded room did you feel alone did you call up your mother and tell her you love her or dust off that bible at home did you open your eyes if it never happened close your eyes and not go to sleep did you notice the sunset for the first time in ages? Speak to some stranger on the street. Did you lay down at night and think of tomorrow? Go out and buy you a gun. Did you turn off that violent old movie you're watching? And turn on I Love Lucy reruns. Did you go to a church and hold hands with some stranger? Stand in line to give your own blood Did you just stay home and cling tight to your family Thank God you have somebody to love I'm just a singer of simple songs I'm not a real political man I watch CNN but I'm not sure I can tell you The difference in our rock and our band but I know Jesus and I talk to God And I remember this from when I was young Faith, hope, and love are some good things He gave us And the greatest is a love And the greatest is a love and the greatest is a love Where were you when the world stopped turning on that September day? On September 11th, 2001, treacherous forces attempted to tear our nation apart. Instead, they united us. From the thick ashes and the twisted steel, extraordinary acts of heroism turned our darkest day into our brightest hour. The valiant firefighters, police, men and women, the Red Cross, emergency personnel, and countless other civil servants reminded us again why America will always be defined as the home of the brave. Ten years have passed, but our resolve is still as strong. Our hope is unbowed, and our allegiance is steadfast. Children who barely remember those horrific events have grown into young, committed citizens standing on the cusp of adulthood, ready to serve their country when they're called. Countless lives have been redirected and inspired anew as Americans continue to vow to never forget. Today, we remember September 11th, and we look to the future with steadfast faith. This morning, we remember and we honor those who lost their lives on September the 11th. We also want to remember the responders who still serve our country today. With us today, representing 
are policemen and women around the country, Reverend Emil Balliot, chaplain of the Grand Prairie Police Department. Representing our firefighting community, firefighter Tom Keach from the Dallas Fire Department. And representing American Military Forces, Staff Sergeant Daniel Bogorsnia, a veteran of the Iraq War and member of the 4th Infantry Division of the United States Army. As our screens display the names of those who lost their lives this September 11th, would you please rise as we honor both the living and the dead. Father, we come before you this morning, knowing that you are not far away, but are here closer than the air we breathe. And on that dark day that is etched into our national consciousness, you were there that day too. We thank you, great God, for the privilege of living in this country. We thank you for the heroic sacrifice firefighters and EMTs and police officers and ordinary citizens who did extraordinary things and people who are still sacrificing for their brothers and sisters every day. We pray that this service, God, will bring you honor and glory. 
will be a help to our memory. And God will help us to be better citizens. Lord, we pray this morning for our soldiers around the globe. We ask for their safe return. We ask for your great blessing upon them and upon families that have long ago wished they could be home. We thank you for this day. We give its remainder to you. And God, for every family who on this morning is still grieving the loss of father, mother, child. We ask grace and a peace which passes understanding to keep their hearts and minds. It's in Christ's name that we pray all these things. Amen. You may be seated.
Thank you so much, choir. Take your Bibles if you have them this morning and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if you don't have a Bible today, we're going to put most of these on the screens, we hope. How many of you are glad to be Americans today? Say amen. Awfully grateful that even though today is remembering a tragic event, that we can thank God we still get to live here and still enjoy the freedoms we enjoy every single day. Where were you when the world stopped turning? That's a powerful song. And I think it's because it asks a powerful question. On September 10th, 2001, the economy was rolling right along. 401ks were solid. They tell us 8 out of 10 Americans couldn't even define the term jihad. And business was basically usual. But as every single one of us knows, on September 11, 2001, everything changed. And if we were to go through this auditorium this morning with a microphone and go seat to seat, on up into the balcony, every person here could name an area, a place, a physical spot where everything changed for you. Some of you, it's a particular spot on the highway when you heard the news on the radio. For some of you, it's in an office where coworkers gathered around a little television and you couldn't believe your eyes. Perhaps you were out to coffee with a friend. Perhaps you were young and you were seat, uh, seated in school or you were a teacher there in a classroom and couldn't believe what you were seeing. But wherever you were, you'll never, ever forget that moment and that place. For me, I, I was actually on my way to visit a widow in central Florida. I almost hesitate to tell you that because it sounds so self-righteous. I was doing God's work on September 11th, um, visiting the fatherless and widows. What were you doing? But we had a lady in our church. Uh, her name was Mildred Roberts, Robertson, and I was pastoring in Claremont, Florida, about 30 miles west of Orlando. And Miss Robertson, uh, her sight was failing, her health was failing. She had had her driver's license taken away from her. She was just in a real tough spot. And I was uh, on my way out on the highway to see her. I was listening to sports radio, and I'll never forget them breaking in and saying, we don't know what's happening. A plane has hit one of the Twin Towers. I thought, I, I, probably like most of you, that it was an accident. I thought somebody had gotten off course. I thought it was sort of a fluke, freak event. And then I arrived at her house and found Miss Robertson there in her little chair watching her television. And we sat down together for the next long period of time. And I'll never, ever, ever, ever forget that when that first tower began to come down, I literally could not believe my eyes. I literally thought I was just making that up in my mind, that there was no way that building could be headed toward the earth. I was shocked. President Bush maybe described our feelings best uh, in the days after 9-11 when he said this, the pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. I think for a lot of you like me, it started out as shock. How could this happen in America? How could this happen on our soil, on our buildings, on our Pentagon? But that shock very quickly just turned to rage. Just absolutely furious. That the cowards could use our own planes and our own civilians to target those sites. There were a lot of us who joined the military at that point or strongly contemplated it. We were enraged. 
And I think our fury turned into something else. I think it turned into a realization that things were never going to be exactly like they had been before. There were some things that up till 9-11, I think we as a nation had forgotten that we remembered again on that day. I think we remembered that security is an illusion. Security is an illusion. When I speak of security, I'm speaking of safety, that general sense of control. That sense that we're America, and because we're this powerful, because we're this wealthy, because our intelligence community is this skilled, because we have two oceans separating us from our enemies, that somehow we've got life under control, and maybe for the first time since Pearl Harbor, we realize that sense of control is an illusion. That you are, in fact, always vulnerable. That you can't possibly protect against every threat when those threats are walking around on your own soil and are educated in your own universities. I think we also remembered on that day that our relationships are everything. Our relationships are everything. I'd heard a story some time back about a very wealthy lady on the sinking Titanic. And one of her servants apparently described this woman in a panic, rushing into her elaborate stateroom with beautiful robes and wealthy attire. And how she ran into the stateroom and reached past a large chest of very expensive jewelry, to a basket of oranges and grabbed those oranges and stuffed them into her pockets and ran back out of that stateroom. You see, when it's life and death, all your values change in a moment of time. On that day, listen, we weren't talking about 401Ks. We weren't talking about the Dallas Cowboys. We weren't talking about the homes that we own or the boats that we own or golfing with a friend. Our most valuable possession on earth on September 11, 2001 became these cellular phones. I'll never forget that the sports community, I was reading a story about Vinny Testaverde and the New York Jets, who at that time were coached by Herm Edwards, that they came together after 9-11 and the NFL was still talking about playing the next game, that it would be good for the country to go on, and how the New York Jets voted anonymously yet unanimously that they would forfeit the game, that they would not go out and play. After all, this was just sports. How many players said the exact same thing and the NFL ultimately canceled that week? Our national religion, pro football, mattered very little at that point. And what about the political realm? Do you remember the day when it didn't matter if you were a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent? It only mattered that you were an American, holding an American flag, standing on courthouse steps, singing God Bless America with apparently the ACLU nowhere near the steps because they didn't breathe a word. But politics on that day mattered very, very little. On that day, The people who gained our undivided attention were not the athletic, were not the beautiful, was not the movie star, was not the American idol. It was the average citizen who helped wrestle away the controls of an airplane from a terrorist so it wouldn't hit our capital. It was the firemen who, we watched those videos and I wept at the sight of those firemen. I'd never seen it before, but the look in their eyes as they were getting on their equipment, contemplating, rushing up into those buildings while everybody rushed down. There was fear in their eyes, but they conquered their fear and they went up and many of them didn't come back. Our focus that day was on policemen. Our focus that day was on EMTs. Our focus that day was to hug our babies a little bit tighter and treasure our loved ones a little bit more. We realized something we'd forgotten, that relationships are everything. And most of the rest of it doesn't matter too much. We remembered something we had forgotten on that day. Or should I say someone we had forgotten? We remembered that God is still very much needed after September 11th. 
Someone once said there are no atheists in foxholes. And it seems to be very true that in life's most horrific circumstances, there's an intuitive sense within us, no matter what we've said, no matter what we've espoused, that there is a God and that we need him. And in those moments, we pray to him. When the bullets fly, when the towers crash down, we come before God. We ask the question, where were you on 9-11? We could ask the question, where were you on 9-16, the Sunday after September 11th? And for most Americans, the answer was church. Churches for a brief window were absolutely filled to capacity. These people were rocked to their core. And they had a desperate, desperate, felt need of God. Many of you on Saturday saw the tribute to the, the um, men and women from Flight 93, United Flight 93, who wrestled away control of the airplane from the terrace. There was one man on that airplane by the name of Todd Beamer. And, and he's famous because on... on, on the tapes they had, he was the one who gathered together with some other men and said, let's roll before they stormed that cockpit. And his wife, Lisa, had written a book by the same title, Let's Roll. And Lisa, in, in this book, and it's a good one, talked about two different services that she went to after Todd's death. She went to one service at her church with her pastor, with her loved ones, with her friends, and then she attended a service that was far more political in nature and, and certainly well-meaning officials coming and speaking to the families of those who'd lost loved ones. But here's what Lisa Beamer wrote. I couldn't help but compare this service to the one in Plainsboro the day before. Todd's memorial service had been so uplifting, so inspiring, because the emphasis had been on the hope that God provides, especially in the midst of crisis. On Monday, as I listened to the well-intentioned speakers who were doing their best to comfort, but with little, if any, direct reference to the power of God to sustain us, I felt I was sliding helplessly down a high mountain into a deep crevasse. As much as I appreciated the kindness of the wonderful people who tried to encourage us, that afternoon was actually one of the lowest points in my grieving. It wasn't the people or even the place, she writes. Instead, it struck me how hopeless the world is when God is factored out of the equation. My brother Paul noticed it too, a deeply compassionate man. He later said, it was heart-wrenching for me to see people grieving without hope. I've never seen a more vivid illustration of the truth. We mourn, the Bible says, but not as those who have no hope. Listen, as a nation, that's where we were after 9-11. Seeing things perhaps more clearly. Seeing our relationships in, in much greater perspective. Seeing our need for God vividly. Our slogan for the time was this. We will never forget. We will never forget. But the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, and I think I'd be a hypocrite not to state it truly, in large part we have forgotten. I don't believe that we've necessarily forgotten the brave men and women who gave their lives. I don't believe we've forgotten the many, many, many of our citizens who died. I don't believe we've forgotten the war on terror. I don't believe we're going to give up days like this. I do believe we have largely forgotten the lessons we learned from 9-11. We have begun to slip back into our national apathy. The same false securities, the same selfish living, the same forgetfulness of God. I want to entitle my message in the short time we have together today, where were you when the world stopped turning, and where are you today? Let's make it personal today. What we saw on these screens, whether you were in New York or not, is deeply, deeply 
personal. Let's make that question personal. Where are you today? May I ask you, I know it's personal. Please bear with me because I think it is so terribly important. Are you in a daily relationship with your creator God? Do you know him? Do you talk with him? Do you walk with him? More than once a year, more than at a funeral, more than at a memorial service. Is he your God? Do you know him? Do you remember him? Is he yours? Are you living a life of service to others? Fathers, are you serving those children? Husbands, are you serving your wife? Citizens, are we serving our community, our schools in Grand Prairie in such dire need? Are we praying for our police officers and our firemen? Are we living a life that is absorbed in self and trivial pursuits and the acquisition of wealth and pleasure? Or are we living a life that counts, one that serves other human beings? Or are we investing our life in false securities? Have we rolled back into false hopes? If I can just make this money, if I can just get this promotion, if I can just enjoy this vacation, my life will be complete. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you, I had a splash of cold water on September 11, 2001 that woke me up from some apathetic living, and I don't want to visit there from time to time. I want to live there and not waste my life. And I would imagine most everybody in here would say the same thing, Pastor, we don't want to waste our lives either. This morning, let me tell you, and we're going to get into 1 Corinthians chapter 15 just a bit. Let me tell you why I believe it is absolutely critical in this relatively peaceful moment of our history that can change tomorrow, that can change today, but why it is absolutely critical in this relative moment of peace that we remember the things we've forgotten. In our text, we find the Apostle Paul writing to a church just like Calvary Baptist, but it was a church in a city called Corinth. And Paul is writing to these church members who were having some serious theological questions. I would imagine that most all of you understand the central tenet of the Christian faith. I mean the hinge pin, the thing that everything rides and falls on is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything we preach, everything we talk about, everything we read from this Bible all ties back to the fact that we believe God's Son, Jesus Christ, died on a cross and we believe that he was buried in a borrowed tomb and we believe he came back from the dead three days later, that he literally resurrected from the dead. Listen, if you can disprove that, if you can do away with that, there's no Christianity left. But these church members in Corinth were being told by certain parties within the church, hey, Yes, Jesus died. Yes, he was a good man. Yes, he was a good example. But he didn't really come back from the dead. And this is how Paul replied to those church members. Chapter 15, verse 12. He said, what on earth does this have to do with what we're talking about? Hang in with me just a minute. Verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, Paul wrote, how say some among you that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. That word literally means empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we're found false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. In other words, we're liars if it's not true. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised And if Christ be not raised, your faith is empty, you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep, those who physically died as Christians in Christ, are perished. Now listen to this. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now Paul writes, is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? Get what he's saying. Hey, church member, listen. If Jesus didn't come back from the dead, 
All this Christianity business is empty. We are utterly and completely without hope if that event didn't happen and he didn't truly come out of the grave. And, and I can hear someone asking in that congregation, well, wait a minute, Paul, I mean, Jesus was a great example. He proved some amazing things. Why is it that dire? Why is it that serious that Jesus came back from the dead? Go down to verse 25. For he, Christ, must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Here's the point. Ladies and gentlemen, we got Osama bin Laden just a few months ago. But may I tell you that the ultimate terrorist still lives. And the ultimate terrorist is death. I heard a story, a legend in fact, of a merchant in Baghdad who one day sent his servant to the market and before long the servant came back. He was white, he was trembling, he was in tremendous distress. And he said to his master, down at the marketplace I was jostled by a woman in the crowd and when I turned around I saw that it was death who jostled me. She looked at me and made a threatening gesture. So master, please lend me your horse for I must hasten away to avoid her. I'll ride to Samara. I'll hide there. Death will not find me. As the legend goes, the merchant lent him his horse. The servant galloped away in great haste. And later the merchant went down curious to the marketplace and saw death standing there in the crowd. He went over to her and asked her, Why did you frighten my servant this morning? Why did you make a threatening gesture? That was not a threatening gesture, Death said. It was only a start of surprise. I was astonished to see him in Baghdad, for I have an appointment with him tonight in Samara. Listen, ladies and gentlemen. The ultimate terrorist still lives. And listen, it doesn't have to find you in a plane on September 11th. It can find you in a cancer ward. That terrorist can strike at your body. It can strike at your mind. It can strike as an illness. It can strike as a cataclysm. But listen, all of us have an appointment with the ultimate enemy, what the Bible describes as the last enemy, and that enemy is death. And you can't avoid it. And as safe as you can make yourself, as far as you can run, as fast as you can flee, everyone in this auditorium, everyone in this city, everyone in this world has an appointment with that terrorist. And the Bible from cover to cover paints the picture of human beings who in and of themselves are not ready for that appointment. We haven't lived good enough. We haven't lived right enough. The wrongs we've done cannot be expunged from the record by the rights that we have done. We're not ready when that plane crashes to stand before a perfect God. Friends, the second bit of information, and this is why Paul wrote, is that not only does the ultimate terrorist still live, the ultimate rescue has already taken place 2,000 years ago. I want you to look at the text of chapter 15, verse 51. Paul said this, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. In other words, not everybody's going to physically die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed. For this corruptible, this mortal body that breaks down and is prone to sickness and in death must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, he writes, where is thy sting? 
O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, get this part, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what he's saying. We all have an appointment with that terrorist. We all have a 9-11 moment in our future when the tower of our life comes crumbling down. But God says he has done something to prepare us for that moment that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came down from heaven, not just as a good man, but as the perfect son of God. And listen, when he died on that cross, the Bible says, unless this book's a lie, the Bible says he was doing more than proving a point. The Bible says he literally was making payment for our sins. Every time I think, of policemen and firefighters who ran towards the flames, who put themselves between harm and the citizens of that city. Every time I think of those saviors, I can't help but think of the ultimate savior who bore death and hell on his shoulders so that we wouldn't have to. Friend, the story of Christianity is that Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, paid the price of our every sin, paid the price for all our wrongs, paid the price to make us right, that he can make you perfect in the sight of God, even though you're so far from perfect. Friend, I ask you this question. I don't ask you whether you are a good person. I don't ask you how moral you are. Do you understand that that's all relative? That if you put Adolf Hitler here and Billy Graham and Mother Teresa here, wherever you fall on that continuum, it's not good enough to come to God. God needs perfection, and Christ is the only one that can give it to you. On that day, September 11th, 2001, to be rescued, you had to let the rescuer do his job. You had to let him help you. You had to let him use his expertise. You had to let him use his bravery. It was humbling indeed, I would imagine, to be brought down out of that tower so you and your family could be saved while a firefighter was giving up his life. But the only way you could be rescued is to let the rescuer do what he did. Friends, if I can get one thing across that I believe with all my life and my heart and my soul and my mind, because I've experienced it firsthand, you're not looking at a good man up here, but you're looking at a man whose dependence is only on one, and that is the Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can save you. But he can save you. Do you have a relationship with him? Do you know him? Is he yours? This and I'm done. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Paul ends it this way. He's writing to Christians. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be unmovable, unmovable, be always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In other words... Because you know him, because you know there's life after death, because you know your 9-11 moment, whatever it might be, wherever it might come, is not going to be the end of you. That your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, your personality lives on with God after death when you know Christ. Because you know that, you are free to give your life away to other people. Most of us are not free to lose face. We're not free to lose money. We're not free to lose time. We hold it with clenched fists because we feel like this 60, 70, 80 years is all I've got. But when you know that God has you, when you know that there is life eternal beyond this life, you are free to let loose your grip and live for other people. And that's going to mean investing some time in them, losing some resources because of them, losing face at times because of them. But you are absolutely free to do it. I was looking back um, 
this week on an emotional document for me. The sermon I wrote on September 11th, I pulled out of my files. And first of all, I thought, how in the world did anybody listen to this guy preach? And then I thought, how do they listen to him now? But I thumbed through those files and that sermon, and there was a lot of hurt in that sermon. There's a lot of fury in that sermon. But I remember I had been asking God that day to give me some some peace about what had happened, some sense things were going to be okay when everything seemed not okay. And I believe he led me to the strangest place. I picked up the Orlando Sentinel right around during that time and this was a small section of an article in the Orlando Sentinel by a guy named Mike Thomas and here's what he wrote. Before September 11th, 2001, terrorism was a pitiful loner blowing up a federal building or bumbling bomb builders botching an attempt to bring down the World Trade Center. But now all things are possible. Germs, nukes, nerve gas. I look at my family and for the first time I feel very vulnerable, Thomas wrote. I guess this means the attack worked. People compare this to Pearl Harbor. I wish that's all there was to it. I wish we could drop bombs and storm atolls and be done with it, but this war does not end. I think of Vietnam. I think of a determined ragtag army. It is invisible, spread thin, presenting no easy target, unbeatable for even a superpower. By the way, you say, you got encouraged by that? Hang on. We lost there because we could not hurt them enough to make them stop hurting us. And then this line, how can you hurt someone not afraid to die? And it hit me like a ton of bricks. How can you hurt someone not afraid to die? I don't mean that we all don't have a natural sense of fear and trepidation at the process of death. What I mean is that in Jesus Christ, you can have the invincible, unshakable belief and hope in your heart and your core and your soul that there is more to life than this life. And that however your life is taken down, however death strikes you one day, that the Savior Jesus Christ has already conquered it for you. I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would. For all of our guests, I want to describe this conclusion to the service so there's nothing unexpected. At the end of, of every time when we look to God's Word, when we talk about his plan, we like to pause for just a few moments at the conclusion of the service and just quiet everything down. And here in a moment, I'm going to stop talking. And I would invite you, wherever you're at in your seat, to take a moment and talk to God. To take a moment and ask the question, Where was I with God back then? And where am I with God right now? To ask the question, do I have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Say, what does that look like with an invisible God and a very visible world? It looks like, my friend, you've had a profound change of heart toward him where you know him. He's real to you. He's relevant to you. You've asked Christ to be yours. I don't believe there's there's anything I can apply to you to give that to you. I don't believe there's any mountain you can climb, any great work you can do. I believe that just like with a firefighter in that building, you let the rescuer do what he does. And you give your life to him.
going to say a word of prayer. We always open these altars in case you need to step out and come pray. There's nothing magical or mystical here. But sometimes we need to move. If you need to pray with a counselor, there'll be somebody here at the front to pray with you. If you need to talk to God right there in your seat, you can do that too. He's here. While we talk to him, can we take a moment at altar and seats to thank God for this country, to thank God for those who've paid the price, to thank God for those who are paying the price, to ask God to make us more like them. Father, we come before you, needy people, and our greatest need is recognizing our need and not being filled with every idol we can find. So caught up in games and pleasures and wealth that we don't feel the need of you. So packed with anesthetic that we don't even sense our pain. God, I pray you'll empty us out this morning if needs be. To see the greatest need there is, our need of you. I pray that someone silently or with a counselor today would pray that simple prayer of, God, I know that I'm nothing. I know I've sinned. But Christ, if you can save me, here's my life. I'll take you. You take it. Bless somebody to pray that prayer, Lord. And bless this time as we seek your face. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. While Trey leads us, let's have a moment. Let's just talk to God for a few minutes. If you need to come, come on right now. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows time uh, give a round of applause to our guests who've come out today yeah we are awfully awfully grateful for what you do and uh, here in just a moment my wife Jenny and I are going to be heading back to our little guest reception room right on this side back in the foyer 
And if you're one of our guests today, we'd love to get to shake your hand and me introduce you to my dear wife and just thank you in person for coming today. Uh, if you're one of our guests, don't forget Financial Peace University this Tuesday night, 6.30, not too late to get in there. Um, help you get out of debt, help you get on top of that thing. And just check your bulletin on all the other events. No services tonight. Arlington Baptist is having a special service at 6. Feel free to go out there. But Trey's going to lead you one more time in that. Guests, feel free to make your way out into the foyer right now and into that room if, if uh, you'd like. And members, hang around just a minute so they can get out. And he's going to lead you in one more chorus, and then you'll be dismissed. God bless you. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sighed the clouds be rolled back as the scroll the trump shall resound and the Lord Next week. We love you guys. God bless.